Floor has a very strong safety-driven culture. And as such, we always include a safety topic in our meetings. Please watch until the very end of this video to hear Floor Fellow Martin Coaster discuss the cost of safety programs. Well, good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Estimates are created to determine the cost for new facilities based upon best available reference information. However, as we move into new industries or new technologies, we cannot always rely on traditional estimating methods and available reference materials to determine the estimated capital investment. In this webinar, Floor Fellow Martin Coaster and Lead Estimator Yarun Guratz will discuss how to create high quality cost estimates. In addition, they will also address the difference between the traditional approach of a capital cost estimate and estimating new technologies in the earliest phases of a project. Today, we want to explain about what it takes to make cost estimates for new technologies in a dynamic environment. We want to do that by means of first setting some definitions at the beginning and then reflect those definitions in what it takes in the traditional world from a project facing perspective as well as from a project execution perspective. And then we will like to reflect that, but what if we look at not the traditional technologies we will see, but the new technologies. And does it mean that we apply the same um, methodologies, the same techniques, or do we need to adjust new techniques? So to answer that question, uh, how it uh, will work for capital uh, cost estimates, I mentioned I first want to go to some definitions. And the first definition I want to address is what is a capital cost? And the other one is what is an estimate? But let's first go to what is capital cost? If we look at a main source, which we all know, Wikipedia, and we uh, look there what is described as capital cost, we see that they describe it as the fixed one-time expenses incurred on the purchase of land, buildings, construction and equipment used in the production of goods or in the rendering of services. Now, there are a few words I want to highlight which helps us to explain this definition a bit better. And the first words I like to highlight are land buildings equipment. What we see there is in our terminology, typically the scope of facilities. As scope of facilities are these things which we need to construct and which will remain there at the end of the project. But it's not only the uh, scope of facilities which is addressed in this definition, also scope of services, also activities. And we need to purchase all the materials to make sure that they are delivered at site at the right timing. We need to do the construction, pouring the concrete, welding the pipes, installing the equipment. And one thing not mentioned by Wikipedia, unfortunately, but for us as an engineering company, pretty important. We need to design the whole facility. So there is some scope of services related. If we combine that scope of services with the scope of facilities, in our terminology, we typically talk about the scope of work of a capital cost investment. Now, understanding what capital costs mean, I want to do a similar approach for what is an estimate. What do we mean by an estimate? If you go to the same source, Wikipedia, and see what do they describe as being an estimate, they highlight that it's the process of finding an estimate or approximation which is a value that is usable for some purpose, even if input data may be incomplete, uncertain, or unstable. The value is nonetheless usable because it's derived from the best information available. Now, also here, I want to highlight some keywords, and those are in specifically incomplete, uncertain, and unstable. So in other words, when we make an estimate, we need to realize that the information where we based upon uh, the estimate is maybe not that accurate or not that correct. Uh, it is incomplete. We do know at the beginning of a project that we cannot oversee all bolts, nuts, gaskets, whatever we need. Uh, we do not know for sure how we're going to design the thing, but it will be roughly in that order of magnitude. So there is some uncertainty embedded in any estimate. However, what they also highlight, it's the best information available. Very often we see 
that with estimates, this information comes from earlier performed projects. So although it's something new, we need to estimate. However, we have seen it before in the past on another project, so we can make use of that intelligence and apply that to our new situation. Now, combining these two definitions, what is capital cost and what is an estimate, I conclude this as a capital cost estimate is the best approximation of the anticipated cost for a project or investment based upon the available level of definition for the full scope of work as it is identified during the specific phase of a project. And here I highlight some things that we are early in the project, then the estimate which will be prepared is maybe less accurate, but still is based on the best information at that time available. And that gives us the ability to always be able to make an estimate. Now, if we look what kind of techniques there are available to make an estimate, we can distinct three different main estimating techniques. The first one is an analog estimate. With an analog estimate, we base ourselves upon a reference project and the estimate can be derived by adjusting the cost from based on some key characteristics. Now, this is a mouthful, but if we explain it in more logical terminology, what I try to say here is we have a cost of a plant which we have constructed earlier. We do know exactly what the plant has costed back in time at another location. But if we adjust for time, if we adjust for location, if we adjust maybe here and there for some technology things, we are able to come up with a new estimate applicable to the today's situation. A very fast and easy technique to perform. However, accuracy is not that well because we do not look at the individual components in the facility, but we more base ourselves upon uh, the overall picture. Another technique which we see and which we prefer to use if more definition becomes available is the parametric estimate. With a parametric estimate, what we do is we break down the scope in more smaller components, which we can estimate individually. So the well-known uh, approach, we see it here in the circle between brackets, is the equipment factored estimate. In the industry, we see if we are able to determine a cost for each piece of equipment, and we know what it takes to install that piece of equipment. So if we take, for instance, there is a pump involved, so we multiply the pump by a factor to cover for the foundation, for the piping associated to it, for the controls associated to it, etc. And we do the same for a distillation column. We do the same for a vessel, a compressor, you name it, whatever component. We are able to build up the estimate eh, and the factoring approach covers for all the remaining scope associated to that piece of equipment. You see already that we need to go to an equipment level, so it takes a little bit more time. However, it gives us more accuracy. Now, the third method appearing on the screen here is the semi-detailed estimate. With a semi-detailed or a detailed estimate, we quantify everything, we try to quantify everything, and we apply a unit rate against all these quantities. We multiply at the end the quantities times the unit rate, and we add it up all together, and we have at the end an uh, overall indication of our cost. What we see here is that we bring in much more detail into the estimating effort, we are able to associate it more directly to the design deliverables. However, it also takes much, much more time compared to the analog estimate. Now, these are the traditional techniques. Now I want to see how we can use these or should we change them in the new technologies. But first, before we're doing that, I want to look at the timing when we apply which technique. So I want to talk a little bit about project facing. If we look at the overall project phasing, we see that the total project life cycle starts at 0% completion and it ends with 100% completion, what we call mechanical completion. So the total duration starting from a brilliant idea from some uh, research uh, people involved all the way to we finally have the plant and it's ready for commissioning is our total S curve in this case to show the progress how a project is matured. And at the beginning, we see that we talk about the front end loading one, when there is some block flow diagram available and, and well, maximum a heat and material balance. And in that phase, limited information. However, if we have built one of these facilities before with the analog technique, 
we are still able to come with an estimate for that facility in the new situation, in the new uh, location, or uh, slightly adjusted for some new uh, technology adjust adjustments. Now, if we look at, if we go a little bit uh, further in definition of our project, front-end loading 2 kicks in, and we see in the um, uh, engineering industry, typically process flow diagrams will be uh, developed we talk about the sized equipment list. Sizing is preliminary. However, there is a sized equipment list and all the equipment is identified. So the heat and material balance, which we made in a simulation, is translated into actual equipment. And if we are lucky, we have a high level plot that we know roughly what is located over there. Now, these first two phases we typically call the concept phase. And that's where we later on want to dive in estimating techniques for today. If we first complete our uh, project phasing, we see that the third phase is the front end loading tree, uh, and there we see a further maturity of the design. So PNDs comes in play uh, at the end of the front end loading tree. They maximum reach and release for design status. The equipment is associated with data sheets, which describe all the equipment dimensions. We have a detailed plot, so we now not only know roughly what footprint we take for the whole facility, but we also know the individual equipment, what is located over where. Uh, based on the PNDs, we know the connectivity between the equipment. We have started with a 3D model, typically in the industry, to make sure that our plot makes sense, that it is from an uh, operability point of view, it makes sense, that it's from a safety perspective makes sense. And for some, uh, based on the equipment data, we understand what are the long lead items. So if we are lucky, we have some pricing information and intelligence, which we can bring in the estimate for these long lead items. Now this front-end loading two and front-end loading uh, three, we typically call the feed phase. If you look at the level of maturity, we see that a full quantification can be supported in this front end loading three phase. So at the end of front end loading three, we should be able to come up with quantities and come up with a full detailed estimate to support uh, our investment decision. Now, after the front end loading three, the detailed engineering comes in play. So there is no longer an estimate, but it's more a continuous basis of project controls who reports the cost. PNDs becomes a release for design, a construction status, sorry, a release for construction status. We see that for the piping uh, routings, isometrics are made, design drawings comes in play. And so we see that there is much, much more maturity. And what I mentioned already, project controls are on a continuous basis reflecting the cost in what it takes to finalize our uh, facility. Uh, at the end, uh, EPC, we typically call it, so it needs to be followed by the construction phase itself. The release for construction p and is translated in the actual construction activities. It has an overlap with the detailed uh, design phase, and totally at the end, we reach the mechanical completion phase. Now, we want to look at the front-end phase, really conceptual-focused. Uh, so let's see how our estimates are used in that phase. So if we see in the early phases of the project, it's very often not known if a project really will materialize, if we really want to start construction. What we see is that very often some business cases first need to be sanctioned, need to be uh, determined and, and finalized and then sanctioned before we really come to um, the, the, the EPC phase of a project. And this is a uh, part of the game where Fluor plays a very dominant role. We do that a lot for our clients to support them in these techno-economic evaluations. And we see that multiple estimates can be made there. So if we see at the start of a project, conceptual thinking, some brilliant brains have a brilliant idea, we see that we go through multiple steps. We develop block flow diagrams, what I mentioned already, we develop a heat and material balance, and then the first pass is there to make an estimate. In these phases, we see that typically the analog technique will be used. Then we continue, maybe this brilliant idea need to uh, scale up from a laboratory scale to a more uh, commercial scale. Maybe we want to make a pilot plan first to prove that technology, and then more and more we move to a more mature design, where again a cost estimate is typically applicable to uh, validate is this still a viable project or not. Now, what we see is what we can bring 
as Fleur, but also specifically as estimating. It's a lot of intelligence which supports our client in really validating is this idea which on labor laboratory scale seems to be very promising, really realistic if we're going to construct this in this part of the world or in this uh, current market dynamics. And that is where we can add a lot of value because we're not only looking at what something will cost, but we also apply the constructability experience or the market dynamic experience in this approach towards what it means in the cost levels. Now, we like to reflect that in the early phase of the project, but what are now typical uh, characteristics of this concept phase? If we dive a little bit more into this concept phase, we will see, and what I mentioned already, that the design is relatively limited. So we want to make an estimate, and an estimate always we want to have as good as possible, as accurate as possible, as complete as possible. However, it's a bit of a contradiction because we are totally at the beginning of our engineering endeavor. So we need to realize that there is hardly any information on the table, but still we try to come up with a realistic value of this estimate. And it's not only a limited level of design, it's also a limited level of project definition. The geotechnical information is not available, so we even don't know always the exact location. So we do know that we want to know what something will cost if you construct it in the Gulf Coast, or maybe in Western Europe, or maybe in Asia Pacific, but the exact country where we will do that is often in this early phase, fell one, fell two, not exactly known. Same as the timing of the project. We do know that it will take roughly something like 24 months to 36 months to do construction. Well, in itself, that's quite a widespread. So eh, we see that a lot of information is not defined. Still, we think that it's possible to make an estimate in this early phase. And we do that by means of um, uh, making use of a lot of reference information. What you see is if you look at the traditional conceptual estimating techniques which we apply, that reference information can fill in a lot of these gaps which we have in this early phase. For the reference projects in the traditional conceptual approach, if you look at the traditional project, we did know the location from maybe another project. We did know the location from our reference project. So we know, okay, if we have constructed something in the Gulf Coast earlier, and now we need to bring it to China, we know what it took to do it in the Gulf Coast. We know what it takes to work in China because we have seen it on many other projects before as well. So we can make that translation. Same for technology. And many of these uh, traditional conceptual estimates is based upon a traditional technology as well. And that technology, we do know what it takes to uh, price that. Timing is much better known because from that historical project, we did know that we have constructed that facility before in 24 months exactly. So now we do know that it must be somewhere between 20 and 26 months, 24 and 26 months, something like that. So you see that there is much information of these gaps which we can fill in based on the traditional intelligence we do have. Besides of that, also we do know that our clients use this same technique over and over again. And especially with the larger clients in the world, we see that they have constructed not only, and they are not only known of that this technology is already constructed before. No, it's in many cases for themselves, there's so many plants in row which they need to construct. And they can even bring a lot of this intelligence on the table, which helps us to fill in the blanks in this conceptual phase. And besides of having this reference project available, we also know a lot about the location where we want to construct a new one, like contracting rates, because we have done construction before, or uh, construction parties who are involved there, or specific requirements which there are on other uh, things for that exact location. Now, if we reflect this concept phase on the traditional technologies, we see that traditional technologies can bring in to help filling in these blanks. Uh, the traditional technologies, if we talk, for instance, in the refining uh, sector where we have the traditional refining technologies or in the petrochemical sector where we see a lot of the old technologies which are applied over and over for decades already, we see that these are mature developed technologies. These uh, very often fall under an IP 
situation by a licensed technology supplier, but these technology suppliers very often are multiple ones. So we do have a lot of intelligence about that technology because there are multiple technologies available or suppliers available for that, which we have seen before. It's very often proven technology. And also, and that's very important, in many cases for these traditional technologies, it makes our life much easier because a lot of construction data and operational feedback even for those plants who are up and running in the world is fed back into design already before and they are already taken care of. Eh? So our new design is taking care of these circumstances and specifics. Now, if we talk about technologies, what do we need to think about? Refining technologies, you see here a few, eh, some open art technologies which do not fall under a licensor but uh, like for instance is our water stripper or a gas plant. But also we see specific license units where technology providers are applicable like hydrocrackers, fluidized catalytic, uh, catalytic crackers or a self recovery unit. These are very traditional uh, technologies which we have seen, well I said for decades already in the industry and it's not a first of a kind. So for us it's easy to apply the analog technique. We can draw the parallel to the chemical side, there we see also traditional chemicals coming from steam crackers and making a lot of the derivative products. And we see that in the old traditional way, there is a lot of things known because these are all building blocks which are already available, which we have seen over and over again in the past. Now, here I want to hand it over to Jeroen, who will explain what it takes if we start focusing on new technologies where we do not have those building blocks readily available. Jeroen? Thank you, Martijn. Thank you for the introduction and setting the basis for, for, the, for the discussion around new technology and how we uh, approach that uh, within estimating. Before we go there, uh, let's have a look at some examples of, of uh, new technology projects. So this, uh, what you have in front of you is a listing, is a list of examples of of uh, reference plant types or, uh, or new technologies that we currently see a lot in the market. Uh, just to give you some examples of uh, what we are addressing here. So carbon capture, CO2 liquefaction is something that appears a lot in the news. There's a lot of focus as well on hydrogen, ammonia, biofuels, uh, aviation fuels as well. Uh, furthermore, um, there is also a lot of movement on the waste, waste plastic recycling, uh, battery production, of course, uh, for uh, the electric cars. And there's a big focus on uh, rare earth metals, green steel production, and even small modular reactors could be considered a new technology as well. So how does estimating work for new technologies in, in a new market now? So what, what do all these projects have in common? Now, one of the things that Martijn already introduced before is that in the traditional world, there's a lot of reference information available. If you really focus now on the new technology projects, you will see that in, in, in most cases, we are dealing with the first of a kind technology. And in some cases, the designs are not fully proven yet. In, in some cases, clients are working uh, in a lab uh, situation, trying to scale up to a pilot plant capacity, or even going from a pilot plant capacity to commercial scale. But on the way to that commercial scale, certain design principles may have to be revisited and updated before the, uh, the plant will work. So there are some, um, some re-engineering activities that need to happen. Furthermore, uh, some other aspect here of a new technology project is special equipment. And the heart of the facility is mostly driven by a special type of equipment, of which not always uh, all the necessary information is available. Now, one other aspect here, um, I'm referring back again to the introduction that Martin gave on the traditional market. Um, you can see that most of those projects are happening in similar or the same locations. Now, if you go to the new technologies, you will see that there uh, are uh, newer locations, new locations for which you have less experience and therefore uh, uh, will have to do something different here. Furthermore, uh, referring to that first of a kind technology, uh, the exercise of scaling up from a lab capacity to a commercial scale capacity, that path uh, will um, uh, we'll see certain re-engineering uh, needing to happen. So there is also not so much reference information available on the execution strategy. However, now we have to develop an early estimate. We have to develop an estimate for these projects as well. 
And we can do that, but how? How do we develop an estimate for these projects? Now, the key to this is basically making sure that the scope definition or scope identification reaches a level of granularity that matches with the available reference information or intelligence that you have in-house. Now, let's have a look at some examples. Now, what you see in front of you are basically three projects. The two projects in blue, project one and two, are uh, projects with a known technology uh, for which we can apply the analog technique, which Martijn explained in the previous section. And we have reference information available for a certain capacity, and we can basically plan factor the cost and uh, also uh, adjusting for location, maybe for capacity, timing, and location. However, project number three is a new technology project. And for that project, we don't have the necessary reference information available, and therefore cannot apply the analog technique. Now, if we zoom into that new technology project number three, what we will see uh, is if we zoom in, that will allow us basically to go to another or different uh, estimating technique, which is the parametric estimate technique. We basically move one level lower in the mechanical equipment definition, and that will allow us to, to see that within that new technology part, the new technology project, there are actually a lot of components what we typically see in all of our projects. If you look at equipment, for example, you will see pumps, you will see compressors, you will see conveyors. If you look at the standard plot scope, uh, you may see buildings. There's, uh, of course, power supply needed, so you have substations, transformers. You may have to install a road around the facilities, and you will definitely see steel structures. So even if it's new technology, there's still scope that we typically manage on a project. So that will allow us for a large part of the project to also evaluate the indirect field cost, the escalation, and the contingency. Now, if you then, in that new technology project, really go and zoom in on that new technology part. Now, the first thing that you will see is in order to estimate that, you will have to go one level deeper in the granularity of your scope definition. Uh, if we further zoom in, uh, we will see that even within the new technology part that, uh, that focus, there's still um, standard equipment, there's still standard equipment related builds, but there is a heart of that facility, a heart of that, uh, the, this piece here, which is really the proprietary equipment, and, and that really will need uh, a semi detailed approach to estimate it. Now, referring back to the, uh, to the, uh, the development uh, within a new technology going from a pilot facility up to a commercial scale capacity, uh, a lot of re-engineering may happen, certain things that don't do work in a pilot situation may not always work in a commercial scale. Right, so these bring in uh, all uh, kinds of risks in terms of schedule, in terms of cost, which have to be evaluated as well. So for this specific part, we'll have to have a closer look at uh, the contingency analysis for uh, estimating the cost appropriately. So after this first introduction and overview on how these projects look like and um, what is contained in these projects, we can actually see that most of the scope within the project is standard equipment. And we saw that we typically see pumps, we see compressors, we see vessels, all typical pots and pans, even conveyors, etc. We also see standard plot-related scope. And by standard plot-related scope, we basically mean buildings, steel structures, utility generation, your fluids and gases, all your storage requirements are covered under this uh, standard plot-related scope. But there's a small portion in the project, which is really the new technology. And that is uh, including the proprietary equipment, a specific catalyst and chemical for example. Now let us uh, zoom out a little bit and look at the traditional versus the new technology sector and try to draw some comparisons here. Now, if you focus on the traditional versus the new technology, you see that as Martijn uh, explained before, we have the traditional world, established companies, they uh, have internal engineering groups, the estimating staff, and, and they work with proven technology. And most of them, they have uh, the facilities uh, working at world scale capacity. Now, if you then look at the new technology world, uh, our experience is it's mostly startups, the young companies, 
the small teams without specific uh, EPC contractor knowledge or estimating expertise. And they have all the knowledge around the technology that they try to introduce to the market, but they're seeking that EPC contractor knowledge as well. It's first of acquiring technology, and in, in some cases, they are working from a scale up uh, from a lab via pilot to a production capacity with all the necessary um, steps that are needed to make it work. If we now uh, further move on, so if you look at more at, at the design uh, processes and specifications, you can see that in the traditional world, um, there's a lot of stringent specifications and standards available within our clients uh, with e evolved safety requirements and reviews, where in the new technology sector, you see a lot of focus on lean design fit for purpose within safety requirements, right? Furthermore, if you look at the control of the facility, uh, you can also identify some, uh, some high level differences. So in the traditional world, you see a lot of focus on centralized control and safeguarding, whereas in the new technology, the focus is uh, still more on local and less sophisticated control of their facility. Now, what is important to understand and what we are see in these traditional projects, uh, due to the fact that there's a lot of reference information available, within the EPC contractor world and our clients. In order to do an estimate in the very early phase, as Martijn already explained, there's limited involvement needed from downstream disciplines. So with downstream disciplines, we mean your piping engineer, your CSA engineer, and your mechanical engineer. Right? So we need as a limited involvement in order to estimate, because you have quite a bit of reference information available to perform your estimates. But if we now go back to the new technologies where the reference information is uh, not available, uh, what we will have to do is to do or to make one additional step to generate this additional level of granularity in our scope definition. And that will require input from the downstream disciplines like the CSA, the engineer, the piping engineer, etc. So a little bit more effort may be required for a certain part of the new technology project. But in conclusion, and that's the message throughout the, the whole presentation here, when estimating a new technology, we have seen that most of the scope consists of items, or scope components, equipment um, that we see in all of our projects. Uh, we looked at pumps, we saw compressors, etc. However, that new technology specific part will require a bit more attention and a bit more scope description to be able to estimate this. But if you look at it from a project level, you will see that uh, the, the project consists of multiple parts of which a small part is really affected by the fact that it's new, new technology, there's uh, a bit of lack of reference data. But if you look at it at the project level, you will see that it's only a smaller part of your total project that may require a bit more effort to generate that scope definition and to estimate that appropriately. David, I'm going to hand over the presentation to you again. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you both, Martin and uh, Yarun. That was excellent. And your uh, experience in the estimating world was very clear in the delivery of the presentation. So we have received uh, some questions from the audience here, uh, which is great. Let's take a few moments and uh, we'll address those questions. And the first one that I'd like to start with, I think I will direct to you, Martin. Um, and the question is, is it possible for an engineering contractor to estimate the cost of a facility if the contractor has never designed or engineered this type of facility in the past? So I'll pass it over to you, Martin. Thank you. Good question. Um, my simple answer would be yes. Obviously, as an estimator, you would expect that answer. But let's explain it also a bit more. Uh, like Jeroen has uh, mentioned, if you look holistically, you see that the heart of the technology is something new. But the majority of the scope in many of these circumstances is just traditional what we have seen before. And 
estimating is applying your historical information on your new scope, your new situation. So for the majority, that is easily be done and not that different compared to our traditional approach. Now for this new part, there's definitely some steps to be taken uh, to get a good understanding. So if something is completely new, even for an engineering company like Fleur, it's definitely important that both the estimator as well as some technology people understand exactly how the technology looks like. Now that brings automatically a kind of contradiction in itself because uh, if it's a licensed uh, situation, then the license will protect that IP. But in some cases, it's not even yet protected by a patent or whatsoever. And in those circumstances, you see that uh, the, the technology provider simply says, okay, can you please supply me an estimate for everything other than this component? Because this component I will add myself. Or maybe can you just add at your estimate summary so much for this component, but you don't, you don't disclose any intelligence about that part of the process. So in this case, at the orange block. So in essence, as long as we can bring it back to a level of granularity that we A, understand the uh, scope of work and B, are able to come back to the majority of our reference components, we should be able to come up with an estimate in an early phase of the project for completely new technologies which we have never seen before. All right, thank you, Martin. That's wonderful. Uh, we've got several other questions coming in here, and I'm going to direct the second one over to Yarun. And the question, Yarun, is does the preparation of an estimate for a completely new technology take a similar level of effort as estimating a traditional facility? I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Dave. Um, now in essence, as I explained before, uh, what you what you could see in the new technology process is that there is always a part which um, it is that little part which requires a bit more definition. Now, when you have to create that uh, next level of definition or go to that granularity level so that you could do a semi-detailed estimate, uh, also will mean that you will have to involve some more people just to, to create uh, a good scope definition for that. Now, as a, as a direct result of that, you, you will have, uh, that will take some more effort logically, right? It doesn't mean that for the complete project, you have to do the same, right? I mean, I hope that it was clear, eh? so we, we have a project, but a small portion is really that new technology part. Uh, so, so in essence, the, the answer to the question is yes, one should expect uh, some more effort and, and, and it varies, of course, from technology to technology, some of which uh, we, we may have uh, a quicker answer to scope definition and for others, you, you may need to do a little bit more. Right? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for that. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of interest uh, on the topic of new technologies here uh, as I see these uh, questions stream in. And this, this looks like a good one. It relates to the level of contingency. Uh, so Martin, I'll come back to you on this one. Does the estimate for a new technology require a similar level of contingency? And is the anticipated accuracy similar? So over to you. Thank you. Um, well, let's first start with the contingency part of the question. Um, contingency is there to cover uncertainties in our assumptions we made in an estimate. So depending if we take the orange block in the uh, hexagon picture which Jeroen showed, um, if that is a large block, then obviously there is more uncertainty in our assumptions for that part and as such it's likely that we need a bit more contingency because we need to make assumptions in a larger part of our scope. If the majority is still well-known equipment, well-known piping systems, foundations, etc., then you can expect that the contingency level is more or less similar. Um, so the content of the new technology part is very much depending in there. There's one thing I like to address as well, and that is with new technologies, we also even see today very often all traditional uh, technologies applied in a new situation, and then we call it a new technology as well. Well, in those cases, we do have quite some reference information available, as you can imagine. Now, if you look at the accuracy, 
Yeah, there it's very similar to contingency. The uncertainty in our estimate will determine on one hand the contingency to cover for it, but on the other hand also the accuracy of our outcome. And uh, our estimating methodology is having more influence on our accuracy level than the, the heart of the process, which is maybe completely new and which is not that well defined before or we don't have reference information. Now, our first line of defense is always in an estimate to go out on the market and ask the market for specific intelligence to support us. So if there is a special piece of equipment involved in a new technology, and it makes sense that we reach out to some suppliers who are able to deliver that piece of equipment and help us to come up with the pricing. Especially companies uh, like Fleur have a very strong relation into the market, so we do know exactly which parties can help us in supplying pricing information for this new specific situation, which is maybe never constructed before. So in itself, we do see that you may expect that accuracy levels and contingency levels are similar. However, it needs to be said that since if something is really a first of a kind situation, really a first of a kind technology not proven yet, there is a chance that during the design exercise, we will find out that if certain things uh, will not um, work in the way as we anticipated. And for those circumstances, it could well be that we like to apply a reservation to have a little bit more contingency available. All right, thank you very much, Martin. Um, this next question I think is an interesting one and uh, it relates to the variety of businesses that could be employing um, you know, energy transition or new technologies. So Yarun, I'll come over to you on this one. And the question here is, is your presented approach applicable for all businesses? So over to you, Yarun. Thank you. Uh, the answer to that question is basically yes. Um, the, the, the more detailed answer to that, it, it, it's, it, it will not be the same for every business uh, in, in the world, right? It, it all re really comes down to, uh, to what extent is your project really a new technology project? Which part of the scope is really new technology? And can you really distinguish in, in between your known uh, scope, scope for which you have references? And really break it down and, and set that apart versus uh, the new technology part. So um, the, the approach is applicable, it's definitely applicable, but it could be that in, uh, in a certain business, your new technology part is, is uh, maybe covering 90% of your scope versus uh, in another business, it could only be 10%, right? So that, that, that will probably be the main difference, but the approach in itself uh, of trying to zoom in uh, or dive into the uh, one level or the second level of detail more just to make sure that you understand the scope first and above all to, to be able to accurately estimate it. I mean, that's the key here, right? And uh, I mean, the business and, and, and the new technology part will drive how, how big of a part of your project is really uh, in need of that additional uh, definition. Great, thank you, Yvonne. That was that was wonderful. Um, here we have another question, which I think is uh, also an interesting one, and it relates to technology suppliers and licensors. Um, so, Martin, I'll, I'll phrase this one to you. And the question is here: Is the role of a technology supplier or licensor similar, and that is related to these new technology projects? to that of our traditional projects as we know them. So Martin, I'll pass that one to you. Okay, uh, let's think. Um, in essence, no. A traditional technology, if you look at the traditional technology, what we see is that um, licenses, technology providers have delivered already for quite a while licenses packages, which they do on, I would say, on a daily basis, deliver to the market. So they know exactly what that license package contains. Uh, obviously, they may need to make it applicable to the specific situation, 
but that is a well-known uh, basis which they use. Hey, they do not start from scratch for a new situation, but they also make reuse of reference information. For the new technology, that's different, because uh, in case of new technologies, we see that the technology provider very often comes even from a lab scale, and the technology is proven in a laboratory, but it's not necessarily means that it also will work if you scale it up to a pilot plant or even to a more commercial size plant. Uh, also, we do know that some of the processes can be scaled up uh, continuously up to a certain extent, and then you need to go for a discrete scaling for two trains or three trains for a certain part, because reaction dynamics or, or thermodynamics doesn't work anymore. Now, that's all well known in the traditional markets, so traditional licensor suppliers do not have to pay uh, the effort to really work that out and find it out uh, and support a an, uh, technology from that perspective. Where we see in the new technologies, that's a complete new era which we approach. So there's definitely a more intensive role for the technology supplier uh, addressed in a new technology. We also see that typically technology providers like to be involved much more in these new technologies because for them it's also new and it gives in return much more feedback about their technology which they can help to improve maybe the thermodynamics, the chemistry, the whatever it takes place in the new technology. So to my opinion, I think that, that a technology provider in a new technology will have a more extensive and a more active role on the project than in the traditional world where we have a more clear interface between a technology supplier and a main contractor like Fleur. Okay, it sounds like our moderator has lost audio. I think while we wait for Dave to get um, reconnected, I'll just ask a couple questions. So, um, Martine, how much does the economic components such as currency fluctuation impact the new technology-based estimates? Interesting question. That's definitely touching upon the dynamic market at this moment. Um, if you look at currency fluctuations, it's very much depending on where do we source our materials. If you look at an overall global project, eh, if you look at a, at a big project in the, in the world, we typically like to source globally to see where is the most opportunistic place to buy our materials. Um, what you see in new technologies is that the heart of the process is new, need to be proven, and as such, it's very likely that technology suppliers insist very strongly where to source that heart of the process. If it's a reactor or if it's a special furnace or whatever piece of equipment forms really the core of the process, it's very likely that our technology suppliers and vendors, or sorry, technology suppliers and licensors will demand that you have to buy it by that um, uh, vendor or by that supplier. So we see that uh, the Western content in this case, being Western Europe slash North America, is for the heart of the process predominantly the sourcing basis for these new technology related equipment. For the remaining scope, it's still open to where we can buy what is the most favorable position to um, and most cost economic uh, attractive location to source our material from. And what you see is depending on how big is that part of the heart of the process, it will influence our um, yeah, business economics or, or our dynamics, to call it that way, with respect to things like currency or also availability of materials. Okay, thank you for that answer. And now um, we'll send a question over to Jeroen, please. So let's see. So does FLOR have a central database where information related to new technology projects are stored that we share with our other global offices? Um, yeah, in, in principle, FLOR, uh, of course, we, we, we can only store what we have worked on, right? So, uh, but yes, we, we capture all, all our project information uh, and, and uh, in order to, to build up a knowledge base as well with 
uh, reference information intelligence that intelligent that at, at the beginning of a new project with new technology is maybe the missing link in order to uh, to to use that, that plant capacity factor approach and for that reason we have to go to the level of detail but yes in, in essence uh, we 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 capture all that information just to benefit from that later on in in in, in other estimates that we do Okay, thank you. And a related question, I'll just still direct to you, Jeroen. Mm -hmm. So if a conceptual estimate is prepared for new technology, what methodology will be used to validate or benchmark if we don't have past project data? Now, in, in, in essence, what you try to do there is also to uh, to, to apply that method of, uh, of um, uh, let's say granularity on, on your benchmark. Um, so, um, what you typically would, would see, you, you try to benchmark what, what for uh, that part of, the, of, of your estimate for which you have reference information. Uh, but for wherever you go to a, a certain uh, level of detail uh, and you go to a semi detailed approach, uh, we, we typically would actually base our cost on, on, on market pricing and market information that we have obtained on one previous project. And by that, Assuring at least that uh, the price part and the installation effort part is is uh, properly estimated and properly benchmarked. Right? Uh, but, in, but in essence, the method of benchmarking uh, could follow a similar approach as, uh, as we do for an estimate. It's just making sure that we isolate that part of the scope which may be similar to an existing technology and, and estimate or benchmarking the other parts of this estimate. Uh, in a more uh, detailed manner or zooming more in to the uh, specific components. All right, great, thank you. So since we're having a few difficulties, we're just gonna end a couple minutes early. <clears throat> so um, I just wanted to thank you again, Martijn and Haroon, for this very informative webinar and the time you have spent today and in preparation. And thank you to our audience for attending today um, it's been a pleasure having you join us. We all understand that uh, there is a direct association of costs to a safety program, which we like to enroll on, on uh, capital projects, which are employed like things for personal protection, safety training programs, the training implementation itself. But in this case, I want to highlight that there is also another cost of safety. There is also an indirect cost of safety. And with indirect cost, what we try to um, identify there is that there is cost associated with things which are not that tangible, like the, the morale. What happens to the morale if you work on a project where accidents happens? What work with the retention of people if you work on projects where there is not paid that much effort and attention to safety? It definitely will have its impact. So in other words, safety could have a much larger cost impact than just the direct related cost for the pair of safety boots or for the um, uh, training program. So a company with a higher incidence or accidents and injuries uh, might have higher attorney and insurances fees, but also more time for research and training, but there is more. And I think that's very good to realize at the, uh, when employees aren't comfortable at work, uh, they were more likely to move to new jobs and especially in today's market where we see a shortage on the labor market in many of our industries, it's very important that we keep that in mind as well, that there is a flip side of not paying the right attention to safety, not only obviously from a personal perspective, perspective but also definitely from a cost perspective.